Hello everyone and welcome to the third episode of The Exchange, a new online platform brought to you by the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre, where we will discuss hot topics that centre around all things race, racism and social justice. I'm Sherilyn Pereira, the Public Engagement Manager for the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre. The recent passing of Chadwick Boseman stimulated conversations around the rep representation of black men in the media and particularly on the so-called silver screen. Today's episode, we will be discussing some of the issues surrounding the role that the film industry and popular actors themselves play in affecting the way that we think about black men and understand how they live their lives in society today. I'd like to introduce the host for today. Her name is Shadia Briscoe Palmer. She is a Stephen Lawrence Research Centre Early Career Fellow and lecturer in media, race and social justice. Also on the panel is Dr. Youssef Bakali. He is a Stephen Lawrence Research Center Legacy in Action Research Fellow. We have Derek Mensah, who is a Special Projects Officer at De Montfort University. Favor Akhtarman, who is a mechanical engineering student in his second year. He's also a, a student engagement associate. And we have Keely Close. She's a second year law student and the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre frontrunner. So welcome to you all. Shadia, over to you. Hello, and um, thank you very much for having me here today. I'm very um, excited and interested in the topic that we're about to discuss today. Um, you know, we, we can't ignore the current racialized tensions that have been happening across this year. And, if we, for many of us, we would say that it hasn't just been this year, it's been years upon years, if not centuries, um, of these racialized tensions and oppressions that many people, many black people have had to face. But this has not just been in the UK or in the, the USA. This is a current racialized tension across the world. And collectively, the voices of the oppressed and their allies are chanting, enough is enough, and I can't breathe, I'm extremely exhausted, and I'm done. This discussion panel will identify, sorry, this year has not only, sorry, this year did not only put forward the centuries of racialized injustices, that had a direct shine, direct light shine upon it. It has also exposed the, the centuries worth of systemic institutionalized racism and struggles shrouded by race, which many non-white people navigate daily. This discussion will identify constructions of masculinity, how black men are represented, stereotyped and typecasted. The panel will also explore the impact of these centuries worth of discriminations and legacies it has placed upon our understanding of black men. Film and on screen will be the example of medium highlighting the influential impact of the media and black, the black male psyche, as well as celebrating the pioneering successes. This evening we'll have three themes that we address. Um, I will ask each of the panelists, you know, a set of questions, they will give their responses. We will look at stereotyping, and typecasting. We will then move on to the makeup of the film industry and as identified previously, the black male psyche in regards to mental health um, and any psychological upsets and occurrences. On the panel, we have a mixture of um, student-led perspectives and approaches as well as academics as well. So that will be a great insight that we're getting on this topic. Black History Month, which celebrates all people who identify as both Black and Asian um, across the UK and within De Montfort University, is celebrated heroically within the communities, but also for those that just want to know a little bit more. However, as we can see through the current racial tensions, whether it's on social media or um, in a newspaper, or even a conversation, not everybody 
wants to celebrate this month or these legacies or these histories. For the purpose of this discussion, I do want to clarify that when referring to black men, and that's what we're going to look at today specifically within film, um, I'm not going to be including all non-white that come under the political umbrella of the term black. We will be discussing specifically black men of black African and black Afro-Caribbean descent. I hope this clarifies um, our focus. And if not, please write a comment in, in the, um, the comment section and hopefully myself or other, and other panelists will be able to um, clarify that further for you. So to go straight into um, the discussion and to ask the panelists um, my first question, I wanna share with you a concept within media and communication studies and um, research and theories of mirroring and shaping. And the concept is about the idea of whether media shapes society, so the films that we see shape society, or is it that the films are barely just mirroring what's already happening within society? So if we take a film, for example, like Blue Story, um, which came out in 2018, um, and which was taken off the cinema screen, due to the fear of it shaping society in regards to violence. Is this a valid argument or was society already like that and the film merely just mirrors what's already happened in society? So to go straight into um, the first question, which I wanna ask, at the, in the current film industry, what types of representation of black men are presented and visible. And can you give any examples of that, please? And I want to um, give that conversation, that question, sorry, to Keely. I mean, um, from my experience, like from what I see in movies, the main like representation that I see is kind of like in hood films, like hyper masculine man um, in like underdeveloped urban areas and um yeah um and then there's other films that i see that kind of either highlight injustice or trauma so like the hate you give um fruit Val station and yeah and then yeah um thank you and David, do you have anything to add to that um yeah i do actually uh I watch a lot of films like anyone else and um in most of the films that i've seen black men are usually either playing the content servant role or they're playing um what you call it they're playing they're playing a white man as in the role that they're given though they're black they're playing the role that you would typically see a white man in so like they would act like a white man do what a white man would do not being racist when i say when i use the term white man i'm not using it in a racial way i'm just using it in a in a way in a behavioral kind of way so just to clarify that they would behave in the way that a white man would behave and additionally like um they're also kind of played as the sacrificial lamb especially in horror movies where it's like the first person to die would be the black the one black kid that doesn't listen to anyone else <laughs> unfortunately and uh, most of the time, like Keely said, in like especially in super in action movies or superhero movies, they're played as um this how do I put it this um they're hypersexualized basically. They're they're like they they have exaggerated muscles, the, like really chiseled physiques. Like uh, they've basically got an Adonis physique, kind of to attract to. I don't really know how to put it, but basically. All their physiques are their physique is basically just over exaggerated to a certain extent, which which you wouldn't really see in movies with like a white lead or a, but in like movies with a black lead that is kind of prominent and like front and center as if they're trying to distract you from something else. And like they're also shown to not really be able to fit into society properly. Like uh, most films that center around black culture or like um, has a predom have a predominantly black cast, 
they're usually shown to there's usually violence within the, the group they're shown as violent and uh and just in general can't really look after themselves without someone from the outside coming to interfere and say all right this is what we this is how you should live and this is what you should do and that's just basically my observations of how black people are portrayed in movies thank you for that favor that's that's been a really insightful summary and acknowledgement of the representations that you see um are portrayed on the screen and i want to build on from that um and ask derek you know can you or do you have anything to add to the roles that are presented on screen but also when these representations are presented or or you may say um when black men are stereotyped and typecasted why is this a problem yeah thank thank you Michelle. um i think i think um you know the, there's a number of different hats that let's say black men are presented in, in in the media and a lot of the time there's negative connotation to it than positive um and the harm in this is that when when that is the continual um approach it creates natural, you know inevitable consequential element to life for example if them be portrays you know the black man to be you know this typical drug dealer or you know he's not good at english or maths and just want to rap or or he does he can't really do anything he can do engineering he can't do that all he does is just dance you know when these films are continually portrayed you know as what life is in the black community then you find that to the onlooker it then becomes like this is all they do so you know when things are not portrayed in the right manner it normalize it normalizes the processes for any person who's watching this stereotyping, you know. So I think that is the damage that it does. You know, for example, I know Chadwick Boseman made a very you know bold comment about you know what his first big break. He was asked to play a, a character, and then he's asked, okay, where's the character's mom? And they're like, oh, um, father, like, oh, the father's not there, you know. Um, and the mom is like a, a single mom working who's also addicted to drugs. And he was he said, no, I'm not going to play this because sometimes. You know, although that that story has been played in Hollywood so many times, and like you know, that, that's not what the whole black community is about. Yes, there are some pockets that have absent fathers, but that's not the only thing that we do. That's not the only thing that's present in the community. So I think when the right, or if there's, there's no balanced approach to portraying the right things in the right way, then we risk normalizing the what is portrayed, which is then seen as the norm. Yeah, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense. And I think, you know, you've given a really good overview of what is actually happening in society and why it matters and it does matter. And um, Yusuf, just, you know, bringing it back to the idea of mirroring and shaping and, you know, what we're talking about, um, black male roles in the film industry, you know, the problems that Derek has just, you know, mentioned, can you see this relating or can you see um, you know, these films or these these typecastings shaping society's expectations of black men, or are these expectations already there? Uh, that's a good question, though. Um, I think ultimately it's always both, isn't it? That there's always that relationship where it's a bit iterative, so it's back and forth between the two, that representations are really important because oftentimes representations are what we draw on to make meaning in our everyday life. So if those representations exist, they sort of become knowable tropes or ideas that we can associate with ourselves or other people. And we sort of tend to use those things to navigate the social world. But obviously a lot of those tropes are historicized. They come from, you know, sets of meanings that exist in society. The thing that I would say is that um, these sets of meanings can go back a long way. And we're not coming from a place where people are were ways or cultures always met on a footage where there was an extremely unequal and often violent relations of power and no sets of meanings that historically perhaps are connected to things like colonialism. They still find their way into contemporary representations. And we can then see how those sets of meanings that have existed historically find their ways or, or are able to re-embed themselves in kind of newer ways or kind of updated ways. So like drawing on some of the things that um, Favor and Keely were talking about some of those representations. These are representations that you can draw back from really the earliest times in film. So we talk about like the hyper masculine 
man or like a black man performing like hyper masculinity if you talk go right back to like for example analyses of films like the birth of the nation which is obviously a really harmful early american uh film which obviously like was intimately tied to the ongoing inequalities in america trying to justify and kind of uh we say like kind of i suppose intellectualize the 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 huge, huge inequalities and violent inequalities that were happening in America at that time. The kind of tropes, they, like, for example, Stuart Hall, <clears throat> in his book on representation, talked about the trope of the bad buck. So that was one of the, the dangerous, hyper-masculine, uh, sexually insatiable black male. And you see elements of that then reappearing in contemporary depictions because it's something that is known or knowable to the audience, something perhaps is marketable in the current current climate and exist in the popular psyche and then you see these these sets of meanings reappearing and, and continuing so that's why i think what, what derek said was also important about representation that you know the kinds of representations that are made are really important because they also set an available canon or set of meanings that we can use to interpret our everyday lives so my 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 um answer would be that it's a bit of both but we should also think about these as is deeply historicized and we shouldn't forget about like the very very deeply rooted and um violent histories that are connected to those as well thank you for that yusuf and it's um it's it's highly important that we remember what has been and it's it's, it's very easy to look at you know what's going on at the moment which is extremely important um but the historical element feeds into um, the narratives that we're having now. And, you know, looking back at the historical walk and, and comparing it to the contemporary racial tensions, which are not much different than the tensions that have happened before us. When you get a film like Black Panther, for instance, why do you think that film um, is seen as and has said to be one of the most influential films of um, a generation? Um, I'm going to put that question to favour, please. Um, I think the reason why is because it was the first ever film that centred completely around a black community or a black a black cast per se. It was purely them. It was focused on what they were doing, what they wanted to do. It was it was done how the black community would want it to be done but from a, how the how they thought the black community would want it to be done and it was kind of like an answer to what people had been asking for because prior to black panther if you'd looked at all the superhero movies um the black superhero even if he did get a screen time it wasn't really a lot or he just they just weren't there at all and Black Panther kind of was kind of like the answer to that. It was kind of like, okay, here's the black superhero. He's the protagonist. He's the one that's going to come save the day. No one else is going to intervene. It's just going to be him and his community. And that's what they're going to do. And that was why it was kind of highly praised and highly rated by the black community, especially because it felt like they had something that they could relate to now, not just watching, I use the term white saviors on the screen coming to save the black people, but mm. The black people actually standing up for themselves and saying you know what we actually have the strength to you know fight back we actually have the we can actually think for ourselves we can actually be technologically advanced and all that uh, that's my, from my perspective that i think that's one of the that was the forefront reason why it was mainly well received in the community yeah thank you and you've you've highlighted the impact on what was done on screen and what we all, you know, those of you that watch the film um, witnessed. Um, and Keely, if I can just ask you a question about, you know, what impact did a film like Black Panther um, and, and Chadwick Brosnan himself, you know, what did, what impact did that have off screen? Keely? David, can I can I ask you the same question while we just wait for Keely to respond? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, um, I think I think um, adding to what Faith was saying, like it's almost the first kind of black cast movie where 
Africa as a continent has been portrayed in a superior manner to the rest of the world. Um, and for a long time, and as history knows it, Africa has been this place of, like, it's, you know, it's painted as a dump, you know, they're not civilised, we don't have anything, you know, you know all and the negative elements about it, you know, in school you're hearing all these comments about, oh, you go back to the jungle, you know, all these kind of comments that you hear. So I think for me, like, uh, and I think for a lot of people, it'd be in a movie where this place that you believe, know that is a great place to be in, you know, for the first time has been portrayed as that place that you feel it is as well as a place of love, a place of unity, a place of culture, you know, numerous cultures. So I think that is kind of really what the um, um, representation really did, you know, off screen. Like it, gave you, it gave us confidence you know, that, you know, what, good, this, is, this is what I've been trying to say the whole time. That Africa had some, that we are good. But unfortunately, the, the history of the past um, uh, circumstances have made it. You know, even sometimes, you know, I, I remember back in, back in school where some of my friends were afraid to say where they were from because it's like, well, the, the first world countries, I didn't know it to be a bad place. So I don't want to sound from there because everyone's going to think I'm also bad and I'm just like everything there. So I think in terms of off screen, it gave a lot of people confidence that this is it. This is what we, we've been trying to say. Although Wakanda is fictional, the story that it portrays is in truth of the misconceptions that people have had about Africa and black people as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a continent really. Yeah, thank you. And ha now having that focus about what happened off screen, um, you know, keeping on keeping on that theme of off screen, but now looking behind the screen, um, mm -hmm. you know, behind the camera, what's going on? Sorry, how does the 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 same lack of representation or um, you know lack? Sorry typecasting and representation off screen in regards to casting directors and um, production directors, how is that impacting the film industry and the films that are produ being produced and put on our screens? Um, Derek, not sorry, yeah. Yusuf, can you, can you um, answer that question for me, please? Um, well, I'm not an expert in, you know, it, all issues like that, but I have, you know, some 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 knowledge on that. And I think a large part of it, and it mirrors other sectors as well. It's not just um, film. We had this problem in academia that oftentimes black academics would have to move abroad. So somewhere like the United States, where there was a more, at that time, a more established black middle class to be able to, or black colleges, etc., to be able to work and teach. And I think we see similarly in the UK, particularly, I think in the USA, they're portrayed as being a little bit ahead but there's still significant barriers and problems for, in, in the sense of having control, creative control over those processes. So oftentimes mm -hmm. you're being cast by white directors, um, often especially when we're talking about the larger budget pictures. And you also have to remember that these directors and these you know producers and whoever else, they're imagining that this film has to make gross hundreds of millions of dollars and it has to therefore be able to reach predominantly white audiences. Yeah, yeah. So what representations of blackness can you can be acceptable or knowable, like readable for a large, you know, intersection of a white audience, you know? Mm. And that's why I think consistently they they tend to typecast because they're worried that a black lead might not win the middle American viewership and then they've lost hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Whereas, you know, uh the black or other minority ethnic audiences might be seen as more of a niche. And I think things are changing in that that regard. Um, and also we're seeing like bigger diasporic connections, you know, between like places like, you know, West Africa and the Caribbean and those markets opening up, particularly like Netflix and new platforms are enabling new and different kinds of productions to happen because they're not necessarily having the same aspirations as like, you know, the big film production companies but it's layers and layers and layers of it you know so it's not just that you don't have black black um black directors it's not just that you don't have black producers but it's also that when they're talking about the kind of money they want to gross they want to feel convinced that they can sell it to a white audience and are a white yeah. audience going to accept a black lead playing a tom cruise role or a you know a tom hanks role in the same way do you know what i mean and and, and that's a that's like, you know, everything comes down to capital at some at some level, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. true. I, I, I agree with I agree with what Yusuf was saying, but at the same time, like leading off what he was saying when he was saying, like, how can um how can a white director 
like sell a black man and still make a gross income i think at that point what they start to do is like okay they they want a black lead in the film to appeal to the um to the black community but then they also want it to be like you know like he said they want it to be acceptable within the white community so what they kind of start to do there is like they put the black man in but the um the uh what do you call it the role he's given isn't typically what you would expect of a black it's a it's a black man but he's playing he's almost whitewash i'm not again i'm not trying i'm not using a racist term i'm just using it as it is he's almost whitewash as in he wouldn't really typically do what a black man would do he would typically do what a white man would do because that's what the white community it's more comfortable to the white community to see what to like see their everyday life on screen especially if the black person is the protagonist like going back to black going back to black panther even though it was predominantly a black led film it was a black protagonist you could still see the whitewash in it because they had to bring it down a bit more so that again not being racist <laughs> the white community could feel comfortable sitting in the cinema watching a two hour three hour film because I know personally, if I walked into a cinema and I sat down for a two hour, three hour film and I didn't feel comfortable, I wouldn't be willing to recommend it to other people to go see it, which going back to what Yusuf said, wouldn't really make them money. So what they have to do is they have to bring it, whitewash it to a sense where the white community can feel comfortable enough to sit down for two hours, three hours to watch the film while also having the black character in there to appeal mm. to the black community as well so they can they can kind of they can kind of play both sides at the same time just to just to just to add into that um um, um i think you know it, it relates to a good question that was asked i can see a question was asked about the presentation you know um um that as long as the the you know the different hierarchies of the media be it in the film industry um, in terms of from directors to producers to actors to the casting crew, as long as that that whole field is, you know, misrepresented by different ethnic um, 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 backgrounds, the final will still have that gap of rep uh, representation. Because, you know, if I'm a black you know director and I'm writing a story, you know, and that story is centered around uh, uh, a different culture to myself unless I have people of that culture with me on that journey, I'm going to, I'm going to be doing it of what I know in my culture based on that, that culture's, you know, how it looks like, if that makes sense. So can I then have loads of rooms to, to misrepresent the wrong thing? You know, and as I, I was saying earlier, when the wrong thing is then put ahead of us or put in front of us, as soon as that cycle keeps going, it kind of almost normalizes it. And then the younger generation would then start thinking, well, this is what we do because that's all we see. And then as that cycle then goes around, that then gets played out. The media then uses that to say, well, look, this is what we put in the movies and they're actually doing it. So look, we're right. And it kind of got this conforming, that's you know, this kind of figure of eight where things are impacting each other. So until that, until the sector changes, like actually let's start telling the whole truth, be it, you know, widen our scope. Okay, we, that character doesn't really need to be white or that character doesn't really need to be black. Okay, they actually, they, they, can, be, they can be blind. They don't have to really, you know, is, is it really crucial to the role that's being played? And ensure you can get the right people in there who then portray it as the story requires them to be themselves in their character that they're playing. And hopefully we can then get some more positive representation, which would then hopefully kind of remove that negative connotations that we tend to feel when we see some groups, you know, presented in the in the in the in, in films and stuff. And I and I hear what you're saying about representation because you know you can argue the representation's there or it's starting mm -hmm. to increase and so on. However, it's almost like it's it's still selective. It's a selective yeah. representation because you're you're not representing, you know, everyone. Or if you are, maybe it's only your lens of a certain culture that you're representing, which in itself is quite worrying. And you know, picking up on um, those that are behind the screen and and having more, you know, we talk about black producers, um, but we're also on about the the screenwriters and the cameraman and the the wardrobe person or the makeup artist, all of that as well needs to represent 
um, mm-hmm. one society, but two, you know, the film. And, you know, we have someone like um, Tyler Perry, who has just um, purchased one of, you know, the biggest um, production sites in the film industry. Um, and, you know, he, he says, and he puts forth, and he's done it in his work that he's going to produce um, more mm-hmm. black as a focus films and TV shows and so on. Why is somebody like Tyler Perry, um, who is able to, you know, have the billions, because we're not talking about millions now, we've gone up a step, um, to purchase something so, which hopefully is going to be so great. Why is someone like that important in regards to representation of um, blackness on our screens? Is that, um, in, yeah. Before before we answer that, someone's asked a question, in oh. what way was Black Panther whitewashed? Well, <laughs> um, well, the most obvious example I can give is um, the magical Negro. For anyone who doesn't know the term, it's basically where there's the black man. It's most like it's always used in um, competition in, co- in competition-based movies where there's the black man, he has some sort of insight or some sort of magical power that helps the white man along his journey. And uh, at the end of the day, the insight the black man gave will help the white man, child, whoever, whatever age, doesn't really matter, helps them overcome the issues that they're facing at that time and like helps them to grow as a person. Now, in relating that to Black Panther, even though it was a it was an all black cast, they still use that stereotype because at the end of at the end of the movie, when Chadwick Boseman comes back as the Black Panther, he says, "Look at me, I'm still here, I'm still alive." And at that point, it's obvious like he's obviously had the he's ob- he's obviously drank the drink of the purple flower, and he's got his powers back, and he's come to fix everything and make everything better, and everyone else can now you know go on and fulfill their purpose in life. And that's how it got whitewashed, because even though it wasn't explicit, it was still implicit, it was still the magical Negro stereotype. And if hopefully that answers your question as to how it's been whitewashed. Thank you for that, Favour. Um, Yusuf, have you got anything to um, build off from that? From, from the whitewashing or from the previous question? Um, if. I was going to say, if you've got anything to build off from the whitewashing, but also the previous question that I asked, if you want to, if you want to go into that one. Yeah, yeah. Would you just finish up the previous question again, so I can? Yeah. So thank you very yeah. much for um, answering the question about um, whitewashed. The question that I asked um, was people like um, Tyler Perry and you know him purchasing the studio and now being able to have the not only um, capacity, but the financial means to produce these big, hopefully blockbuster films. Why is an individual like that and the movement he made, why is that so important? Well, I suppose because it's, it's an example of somebody taking control of the production that's outside of probably the big few production companies that exist. You had have like, I suppose in, in some, some senses, like a monopoly on, on what is produced. Potentially, it's also an opportunity to start to bring through new and different kinds of producers and uh, directors, and like you said, like different groups into those spaces. Like I think so. One of the things when you're talking about, um, you know, all the way through the system where people being absent, you know, black people being absent, absent throughout, and it made me think of. So there's a British sociologist called Joy White, and she does work on UK grime, innit? And she talked about how basically from the ground up, young black people essentially built like videography, cinematography, uh, makeup art, like small independent businesses to be a part of this wider industry, which became like a global product for a time, you know, even now to this day, really. And that's the process that's had to be done, that people have had to do that cultivating work. So then having a large, large organization that can help to facilitate that, or I suppose institutionalize that in some ways, I suppose is important, but I would still say that they will still be held to the to the interest of capital, right? So they're going to have investors, they're going to have um, backers that are looking for a return. So they're still going to have to convince those people that they can provide a return on there. So the interest of capital will still be um, 
there. And it's about how they're going to maybe look to innovate or change or enter into different kinds of markets, which we're seeing with the new platforms. That's what I was kind of talking about before, like Netflix and stuff like that. They're able to, to perhaps uh, target different uh, platforms and different demographics in a way that perhaps Hollywood and you know cinema in the past wasn't. So hopefully by sort of capturing those new technologies, they might be able to do that. But it's still tentative. I wouldn't uh you know place all my bets on tyler perry store yeah and um bring bringing together the idea of you know somebody being able to have a you know a seat at that table but also as yusuf was just talking about you know the, the other platforms that are out there and the other mediums that are being used the different types of media that are being used um to be able to propel um you know black faces on our screen um Keely, do you think that these different types of avenues will start to present better opportunities for black men on screen? I think maybe. I think if it's done right, then yeah, okay, I guess so, yeah. Because I feel like it's like you have to go like movies, but they're obviously going to introduce better representations and then therefore better opportunities for black actors to like, take up new roles. Okay, and you know, I think we, I was in a conversation previously and we got talking about, you know, how these opportunities potentially can bring along new opportunities for new people. Because very often we see the same black faces, the same black male faces, and you know, we can all think and list a few, the Denzels, the Will Smiths and so on. Favor, how can, these new platforms and you know some you know these new big directors and having the big screen opportunities how can we potentially see some new faces or do you think actually we're still going to be propelling the same old faces which they, you know they're amazing actors but we'd like to see some new blood true um uh, in regards to that i think the reason why we keep seeing the same old faces is because is because society has become accustomed and like, uh, what you call it? They become accustomed to seeing those faces over and over again. Like when there's a black person in the film, you kind of automatically assume, okay, it's someone I know, it's someone I'm familiar with. And that's because like those guys have kind of built up a reputation in the everyday household. Like, this is me, this is who I am. This is the sort of characters I play. But like with the newer companies coming out and like, you know, obviously when when like a new company first starts so up like they want to hire the big faces but that's sometimes not possible so i think it is more an opportunity for newer faces to come out and be like okay i've got acting potential i've got the potential to do this i've got the potential to do this on that on the screen you know give me a shot i might i might just be you know i might be the next denzel i might be the next idris elba i might be the next will smith but at the moment, it's kind of not really, how do I put it? It's kind of not really a thing that's being emphasized on because like fresh, most directors aren't really confident enough to take on fresh blood because um, if you like, because if you've already got an established system, you don't really want to tamper with it much. If you've already got, like if you've got a system that everyone's comfortable with that you know will give you money what's the point in risking risking it to get to bring in some fresh blood and then you know losing all that money it's not really worth it personally i think it might take a while but as time goes on especially with what's going on now in like with the with black people rising up and you know speaking and saying we have a voice we might start to see newer black faces on the screen. Like we might start to see new blood take on major roles, like uh, what you call it? Like, you, you know, not just being the one guy that dies off in a horror movie, but, you know, take on lead roles and like be the protagonist. But it will take a while because there's always that, you have to take down the established system first before you can build a new system and taking down the established system is that's the hard bit building a new system is easy but removing what's already there 
it's going to be hard because you still got the older generation there that like that's holding it down that's holding it firm saying we don't want to let go of this it's what we're comfortable with but i think as you know generations progress and the older generation unfortunately die out and the newer generation steps up and takes up the mantle we will be seeing some new faces yeah yeah man you know yeah. building on what you've just said and talking about the you know, a new generation or new faces or, you know, it is happening. It's happening, but it's very slow. It's happening very slowly. And just bringing in some of the comments coming in on the um, on the chat as well. We don't want to end up like, you know, well, we all, I was going to say, we don't want to end up like a tick box, but actually, you know, there's some, the, one of the comments says it's almost like um, movies where black people are included. Um, it's almost like the producer's feel that we're not racist because look we've got we've got a black person so we've ticked that box and we need to get out of that um that we need to get out away from that understanding and all that comes into play from the representation that is portrayed on screen or in and and feeds into society at how black people black men are and i want to move that conversation further into when you are represented in a certain way day in day out on screen off screen after a while that starts to play on you it has to play on you it would be all of us um and yusuf i just want to bring you in here um to kind of start to talk about and and deconstruct how does and what impact does the current representation of black men in the film industry that we've we've spoken about what impact does this have on their male psyche, their mental health? Yeah, that's a good question still. I think, so it's like, the way I kind of summarise kind of what's been said so far is that the roles and the stories and the tropes and the sets of meanings that are connected to black characters are, they don't have the same diversity or openness in the kinds of roles they're often kind of like funneled into playing. As, as as white male actors, right? So there's sets of meanings that are associated with black men, and these stories tend to appear in films, mirroring the kind of the sets of meanings that people carry or or historically have been carried about black men, you know, in problematic kind of settings or ways. And um obviously I say that those reify those things, like they reinforce them in society. And oftentimes people perhaps that have never lived in a community where there's black people or uh having you know or even we have communities now like i you know i'm from from brixton in south london and what you find is that even through the process it means that you get new people moving to the area but then the older populations aren't mixing with them they're sort of separate and and these people carry sets of meanings that don't come from actual engagement they don't realize that people from different cultures carry all different kinds of dispositions and personalities and character traits and all of these kind of things, right? They don't, it's not easy for people perhaps that exist on the outside to understand that. And also it's kind of oftentimes for young people. So I talk about a lot about like Stuart Hall's work and he talks about um, ruptures and continuities about how, you know, young people, particularly when they meet in like the urban cities, like we come from backgrounds where we're not the same oftentimes as our parental cultures, but we're not the same as well as our host culture. So we, we don't necessarily embody the sameness with the majority of people that live, for example, in Britain. So we're sort of becoming something new and that's a negotiated process. We adopt elements of each other's cultural practices as well as our host culture in language and other things as well. And whilst that's kind of a creative process, it also is a process of flux and uncertainty. And in those times of flux and uncertainty, I think, you can find and in my experience and my research, a lot of young men that have been involved in gangs, for example, they adopt a kind of hyper-masculine kind of black male persona because it's one that's known and it taps into the wider kind of psyche of things that people know about um, black communities, right? And a lot of them, if you look at intuitively what they're doing and, and, and how they're, you know, it ties into wider processes of racism. So forces of racism institutionally that are devaluing them in other se sectors, all of a sudden if they embody this meaning associated with blackness, it's something that's known and has some kind of value attached to it because it's appeared so often, it's a story that's so often told in popular media, right? And it's a way for them to kind of cultivate a known persona. But it's also very problematic because it has real consequences for those people. It's not, not a persona to them. 
Do you understand? So if you mm. cultivate hypermasculinity and like violent disposition or whatever it is, that's sort of like the bad buck stereotype. For example, mm. that has consequences for you in your life. Do you understand? So it's not a, a straightforward thing and it's connected also to wider the devaluation, devaluation of, of, of black people and ways in which black people are able to embody a known kind of disposition that can be connected to some sort of form of value as well. I hope that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense for you. Yeah, it, it does make a, a lot of sense um, in regards to, it's almost like a survival tactic as well. And it's almost like, you know, show me, show me who I'm supposed to be as a, as a little child, show me who I'm supposed to be. And when, it, when you talk about, you know, or when we think about, you know, the, the black man psyche and how black men are internalizing these stereotypes, these typecasting, it's not only just because of what they're constantly seeing about themselves on screen or reading, or it's also about how society treats them and how society expects them to be. And when we, you know, when we talk about the film industry and representation, how important it is, it does play on the, the mental health of black men. But this representation, yeah. um, Derek, how does this representation translate this stereotype into the expectations of black masculinity from society? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think, unfortunately, we live in a society that doesn't help you know, each individual to be confident in who they are. Um, so in, in such a society, representation matters because it hopefully gives you the confidence to, to be yourself. You know, and, uh, you know, and I'll probably say that the representation has two two ways of making an impact. There's the impact of all oh, great. I'm seeing myself. So if I'm seeing you know, you know someone like me play a, be a doctor, be a, a physicist, be a researcher, be a I just watched a video on, on on Twitter today where it was a kid and their grandfather doing an ABC song of anything you can be. You know, like there's that. So there's seeing yourself in the plays gives you confidence that okay, I can be like that. You know, and there's also seeing yourself and who you are and how you operate play that in a certain way, which gives a confidence I can be who I am. So I think in such a, you know, in the movie industry where a lot of black men are portrayed as the, you know, that violent guy, you know, that hyper-masculine, you know, hyper-masculine man, you know, doing all these other things, you then, although you're seeing yourself, you're seeing yourself in a way that you're like, well, this is what I'm supposed to be, right? And then when you then take on those personalities, you find yourself, you know, we look at how in our society, black men are the most, you know, in terms of the group that access mental health the least, um, because there's this thing of, well, I gotta, you know, I gotta keep it up, I gotta go. And I'm like, how many movies have we seen where we see a black man be vulnerable and weak and show that it's okay to do that? You know, you don't have to be, you know, you know, I don't know, the you know, the strong black man every every movie and and you know, just go on and you know, still save the day, although you're broken, you're still, you know, going on, you know, why you're still wrecking other people because of your brokenness. So I think there's an element of if the, once again, let's go back to that point, if the negative, you know, connotations keep going on, then this kind of broken system where we see this toxic masculinity of being black men and, you know, uh, low access to mental health, we then just, you know, prolonging the inevitable that eventually they'll just start emulating the same cycle they're seeing because, you know, we're telling them that's who you are, you know, and I feel a lot of the time we, we, like, I remember growing up, like I used to say to my friends, I grew up in Essex where I was you know, the only black boy in my, in my year group. And even in primary school, I was the only black boy in the school for a long time. Um, um, that I say to myself, well, I've, I've got to make sure, you know, I'd be the black person that they know. Otherwise, I'm going to be a phony because I, I need to be this black person that they know. You know, oh, Derek, you like chicken? Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so there's a lot of, if they're, wrong, if they're wrong representations put out there and it makes you become then start acting the way you feel you're supposed to act, but it's not really who you're trying to be, which then has a, the whole thing of, the mental breakdown where you're conforming to a character that you don't really feel you should be or you don't want to be, which then plays a role le later on in life when, you know, you're, you're then, you know, probably having an issue with your children because your children are not doing what you did. <laughs> so you're fighting them to try and do things like, well, why are you crying? You know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? So I think, you know, the representation does matter in the sense that it can help not just the group that are being, you know, not, it can help the group, not just the minority, but it can help everyone because actually, it helps everyone to understand the truth of what's really behind the mask. We can then help our society to be the place that we all want it to be where actually we're not too bothered about representation because we all intrinsically know how each other operates and there's a platform to make that 
those differences known. Yeah. Can I just say, yeah, oh, it was like I can't agree with you more. And also, like when the fact that there's this idea that there has to be authentic representation of blackness. What's the authentic representation of whiteness? Like, who's asking white people to be the most authentic white people they can be? <laughs> that idea that there's some kind of fixity or some essential nature that black people must have, that is the problem, right? And that's the problem in these representations is that you have, you're have you playing a black character. You're not playing a character, you're playing a black mm -hmm. character, innit? And that for, mm -hmm. therefore that has sets of meanings and political connotations. Yeah. And and that's where we ha we're trying to get away from it. Like you know, yeah, that's the yeah. place where we don't want to be. And that that to me speaks volumes of of like yeah, people yeah. feeling. And, and there's so many things that are connected to that, like heteronormativity, like the expectation to perform a certain kind of sexuality and a certain kind of disposition, and a certain, which are just crushing for some people because we shouldn't have to have that expectation. People should be free to be who they are in the same way that white yeah. people are. Do you understand? I, I think it just just uh, sorry. I, I know. Yeah. Like, so I grew up in Ghana for a good 10 years before I came to England, right? And I was saying, this is what happens when you have a minority. When there's a minority, it comes with this identity crisis because you're being, you know, pushed down. So you're trying to, you're, you're trying to be yourself, you know? So then that comes with that thing. Cause I remember growing up in Ghana, <laughs> I just watch TV and just like, yeah, I, you, know, you know, this, yeah, they do that, they do this, they do this. Whereas I came to England and I was like, wait a minute, what is going on? <laughs> you know, it seems there's a path that's been pointed that this is the path I must walk in because that's all everyone around me is, is doing, you know. Yeah, yeah. And 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 that mixture of culture and, and identity is really it's really difficult to do and navigate. Um, as you mm. said um used before, like you you have your 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 parental culture and so on. However, when you come to the UK or you're born here, there's almost like a black British youth culture that we're supposed to all automatically take on and understand and it's it's it becomes quite difficult yeah, and you know yeah. you're, you're speaking about you know what you saw on twitter that's quite that's quite sweet and we're talking about you know how black men are being represented and and the impact that this does but looking up at these black men are these young black boys and favor i just want to bring you in here to um just say a little something on how these how are these representations that we're talking about, how are these affecting the constructions, the de developing constructions um, of black masculinity that these young boys are trying to develop going forward? And when I when I talk about young boys now, I'm on about 18 and below, almost children. Um, from my personal experience, when I was like, when you said 18 and below, uh, when I was interacting with my friends, because in the movies, when you watch a black man in the movies, he's got a deep voice, he's quite tall, he's quite bulky, he's got he's got hair, he's got hairy legs, hairy arms, like smooth chest. And like I remember when I'd go into PE and I'd I'd be getting changed, and all the other boys were like, Baby, you're really small for a black guy. I thought you'd spend all your life chasing lions and running and throwing spears. So I thought you'd like more muscular. And um, that really impacted me because like looking at all the other guys, looking at the black guys on TV, especially like when they show the young men, young younger younger black kids on TV, they were quite big, they were quite muscular, they were quite tall, you know. Some of them were hitting six foot, and then I compare it to myself. I'm like, what four five, smooth baby face, don't even have a beard to any like <laughs> strand of hair to speak of, and um, it kind of made me feel like, am I really black? Like, can I really call myself a black person? Like, and it made me question myself a bit. And I think that's one of the things that for younger kids as well, because like when they're growing up, they're seeing these things and then they're interacting with kids, like non kids that don't understand the black culture. And these kids are like saying, but this is what I'm expecting you to be like. The kid, they're going to be like, but okay, they, they're going to start questioning because it's going to be two contradicting systems because it's going to be, black from an outside perspective and black from an inside perspective. And when those two things clash, and unfortunately kids will tend to go with what their friends say over what their parents have told them and what they've established from hopefully interactions with people from their culture, they'll want to fit in more. So unfortunately it does tend to have a negative impact on younger yeah. kids. And picking up on, on what you're saying and, you know, you know, that there's, it's almost like a pull to and fro in for these young people, young children. 
what it causes is confusion. What it causes is a, a, a massive mental weight on them that they don't necessarily know how to to deal with, to navigate through. And I'm, you know, I'm just looking at the time and this conversation has gone so quickly. Um, I think we could keep talking for another hour. Um, but, you know, the, the, the conversation that we've had just shows, and even the questions coming through just shows that this is a topic that needs to be spoken about. Um, even within the, the few questions that I've asked, there's so many streams that could have gone um, in, in different directions. And before I kind of open it up to a few um, questions from the audience, I just want to give um, you, you guys on the panel an opportunity just to provide a closing um, or a last statement for the audience to leave today with in regards to the representation of black men um, in the film industry. If we, if we start with um, Favour, please. Just, um, we'll just be mindful of the time. Thank you. Um, what I would say is, it's not always as it is on screen. It's nine out of 10 times, it's never as it is on screen. Most of the time, if you walk out and you see a black guy, he's really nice, he's really respectful because from my personal culture, we're brought up to be respectful and we're brought up to be nice to other people because you don't know what someone else is going through. So why would you want to go out and pick a fight with someone if you don't understand them. So we're taught to be generally rather open and caring and understanding of of the situation of other people. So it's not always in the script, it's not as it is on screen. Thank you. Um, Derry? Um, um, I think yeah, there's, a, there's a larger work that is required from all of us in terms of how do we deconstruct the, the misrepresentation, I think. We started the journey, um, um, change is coming. And I, I don't believe change is coming because there's a lot, you know, I'll probably say that the change of mindset is is, you know, is underway and hopefully soon the action will start adding to that. So I think, yeah, we, we're, we're on a good path, really. Thank you. Um, Yusuf? Um, yeah, man, I think, so we talked in previous conversations, we've talked before, you know, this, this session here and we talked about films like Moonlight, we've talked with that, like you know, I like that Moonlight. I like especially because it sort of plays with the theme. So it's sort of set in the hood by it's it's drawing on different dispositions and care and love, but also threads on homophobia and things like that. So it troubles it, and I think that that's the thing that we have to understand when we we talk about representations of blackness is that blackness is different. Like within blackness, there's not one acceptable form of blackness, and I think the same with any culture like whiteness is the same you can't there's not one acceptable form of whiteness or one you know i've met one white person and i know everything about all white people that as we get a, more of a plethora of a more different kinds of representations being able to kind of gain traction which we're starting to see gradually which i think i agree with derek on I'm, like, you know we're not all the way there but we're getting there we hope that we can start to to see that and, and it can be a more of an open space for people to be whoever they are and not just be sort of stereotype or typecasted by their race and by by their difference to whiteness as opposed to their difference within the, the panacea of of blackness do you know what i mean and yeah and what you you know what you all all three of you are picking up on is that we're in a process um you know we spoke about it that it, we're getting there the process is slow i'm not you know i'm not going to lie because we're not talking about it's taken a year, we're talking about decades, if not centuries, this process is slow. And we're waiting for people to get their mind around, their head around, you know, that black is okay. And that, you know, certain films are not just for, just to be saved and shared in, in like a black community. You know, we can list hundreds of films that just stay in the black community solely because of gatekeepers and opportunity and, and money, money, you know, money runs the world and so on and so forth. But what I've enjoyed about this conversation today is that we've picked up on themes and, and realness in regards to, you know, looking at that black male psyche is so important, mental health at the moment across all races, ethnicities, na nationality, mental health is so important. And, you know, when the black men place value, however, are devalued, 
due to who they are and they have to you know put forward and portray a certain type of um masculinity and use if you picked up on you know that hyper masculinity um that in itself that narrative needs to change but that narrative or that that black hyper performance it can't it won't change it can't change until the representation and how society is being educated on the expectations of how black men are supposed to be or how black men themselves are seeing how they're supposed to be how little boys are looking at a screen or looking up at you know generations before them and saying actually i can be the mathematician i can be the person who works at i don't know land rover jaguar building the engines or whatever we need to see black men represented throughout all roles in society and, and i just it's yeah just to say as well and you can be average and you can be normal and yeah. you can be because there's also this theme that you, to be a representative you have to be excellent and it's like you have to be the best of who you are to represent your but no like you can be any literally anything and that is not invalidating your identity in any way and that's what i think is is, is crucial so i just wanted to add it i'm sorry to interject no that's perfect because that's a perfect place to finish this conversation that the only way we're going to be able to move forward and change that stereotypical typecasting representative is if we start to put forward black men as different, as normal, as alternative, as the same, as unique. We need to put forward differences so that we can start to understand, represent, and you know, want to aspire to be different. So if we don't put put it forward for our young people, our, our young boys, our young people in society and when i say that i don't just mean black people now because we're talking about how you know black men see themselves but how society are interpreting blackness and black men if we don't put forward this difference um you won't end up seeing a change how does this change happen that's a whole nother conversation i want to thank you guys so much um for being involved in this conversation i've really enjoyed it i've really enjoyed sharing it thank you Sherilyn. Um, and I'm just looking at the comments to see if I've missed anything, but I'm going to pass it over to um, Sherilyn now just to close us down for the session. Thank you again, everyone who's been listening. Thanks thanks to our amazing panel. Uh, thank you, Shadia, Youssef, Derek, Keeley, Thaver. Um, it was a very stimulating conversation. There was a lot of chat going on um, from our audience. Um, I think we could have gone on for at least another half an hour or an hour at least um, these sort of conversations are always stimulating, always engaging. Uh, if you enjoyed the conversation today, then please do sign up to our mailing list, email us at slrc at dmu.ac.uk. Um, and we, we've put a, a link to um, a short survey. It would take you 30 seconds to complete. If you could do that for us, that would be wonderful. Um, but the SLRC is where these sort of conversations take place. So yes, once again, if you are interested in having these conversations and these debates, uh, they happen all the time at the SLRC, so join our mailing list. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists again, um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.